Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast dedicated to helping individuals start, build, and operate the premier accounting firms in their areas, offering quality accounting services and getting paid what they're worth. I'm your host, Roger Connect, and this episode is going to be a wonderful conversation. We're going to be discussing things ranging from purchasing a firm, growing the business, obviously dealing with things related to acquiring a business, and a variety of other things that I think you'll find very interesting as someone actually moves from the corporate world into actually running an accounting business servicing accounting clients. Now, in addition to all those things, I've got a variety of questions for our guest today. It's Lee Bowen. Lee happens to be the owner of Certus Accounting and Tax Services. He's now owned that for over a year. And obviously in doing so, you've had an amazing career. So Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Roger. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So first of all, give us a little bit of background on yourself. How did you get into the accounting profession? What drew you to it? Uh, a little bit of a long story. I never really intended on being an accountant, okay. actually, uh, even though I did study that. So I went in my undergrad degree and I, I loved accounting. I love the problem solving aspect of accounting. But I but I realized that being an auditor or deep dive into tax law was not really for me. And I loved so I so I graduated with my accounting degree, went to be a financial analyst. OK. All and, right. And I entered the corporate world. So I entered the corporate world in various roles and I had some controlling type roles. But I didn't you know complete a CPA or do anything like that, but I um, worked in the corporate America for a long time and um, had a lot of great experiences. It was a lot of fun. I learned from so many people, and I worked with accountants. I had accountants work for me. I had CPAs working for me, and it was great. They knew everything, and and uh, so I always have had accounting be a part of my life, but I never truly wanted to be that accountant. So um, yeah, that's that's how it came to be. And then I at the end of 2020, I. Decided to hang it up from corporate America. Uh, it was it was fast and furious. Traveled the world, went and learned a lot of international business law, and and uh, it was it was crazy and fast and furious. And decided it was I decided it was time for change and pace. So I kind of retired and was here in Utah and skiing and golfing for a while. And good, I was doing that. And then I realized you know, I can't do that forever. Uh, <laughs> starting to drive my wife a little bit crazy um, as I followed her around the house sometimes. But uh, I realized I need to do something. So I started looking at little businesses here and there. And I got a call one day from somebody who said, I think I have a business you might be interested in acquiring. And so that's where it went. We went from there and here we sit today. I love it. So you obviously moved up the ranks in the corporate world before now owning a business. So I want to go back to the corporate world real briefly. Okay. Uh, as CFO, you were running a multi-international company and uh -huh. uh, very involved with that. Did it for a number of years. I'm curious, what did you like about the CFO role and how would you describe that? What I loved about the CFO role is I kind of felt like I was a middleman and liaison between understanding, you know, the finance and accounting world um, and making uh, heads or tails of that with somebody that was uh, really good at marketing or somebody that was really good at sales or somebody that was really good at other aspects. And so you had cross-functional teams. And I thought that my strength was really taking complex financial information uh, or data, I would say, and yeah. turning into information that could be used and leveraged and to drive the business. I felt like uh, my, my favorite role was just helping steer the business in the direction that it needed to go. And if you could bring that diversity and skill set together and help, I, I kind of helped them take the wheel, but I provided them the tools to, to take the wheel. That's what I really loved doing. And so uh, that was that was great. And I uh, did that as a CFO of, we took a business and it was 600 million at one time. And by the time I left, we had crossed over the two billion range. Uh, so incredible! Yeah, now that's very good. And one of the things I liked about how you ex explained that is the evolution from data to information. And it then, in my narrative, I would explain it being then knowledge and wisdom. We refer to it as the wisdom pyramid. So as you were sharing that, that kind of came back to mind. Uh, the other thing that I liked about the whole CFO experience is you're getting the information to be useful for the decision makers in the organization so that they can kind of guide and manage the business. So I like that explanation as well. So you retire from that. You uh -huh. now follow your wife around the house and you have the That's opportunity true. to acquire a business, obviously accounting and tax. What intrigued you about getting back into the business world but now as an owner of a company, why that as the direction? What excited you about that? Well, I I had looked at various businesses and because uh, I was dabbling saying, well, I can't just twiddle my thumbs and golf and ski all the time. I've got well, to obviously something. you didn't want to do a job. <laughs> so that that's correct. So yeah. I looked at various businesses and I had some criteria that I was looking at. I wanted something that had a revenue stream that was more on a subscription model, okay. subscription-based model so that I, you know, I, I'm not 
the most brilliant marketer that's out there. I get, I admit that I'm more of a finance and accounting guy. And so I wanted something that was established. I wanted something that uh, had a reputation uh, and that could, you know, frankly, I'm a numbers guy. So I wanted cash flow. I love it. And, um, I thought it was very complimentary to my skill set, uh, even though I hadn't been done professional services. I haven't been a part of professional services. Uh, I was very intrigued by that in my own personal investments and, and other things that I had done, realizing that uh, you know how entities are set up, what's the most optimal way of setting them up tax-wise, uh, what the bookkeeping is required to do those kind of things, and understanding what um, an employment tax is, all those kind of things as you hire employees. Uh, I had people before that did that. And now I wanted to be in the midst of that myself. And so um, th that was a criteria. I wanted to have something that, uh, again, was a subscription type business and something that I was familiar with and that I could continue to add value. I knew that I wanted to have uh, team members that were knowledgeable, um, yet I could also be the one that helped take financial data mm -hmm. and turn it into information and be in work with small business owners. So it was very attractive to me knowing that uh, how established the business was that it was on a subscription model, like I said, but also that uh, I could still do the role that I still felt I could be. I could be a mini CFO for various clients while I had, you know, bookkeepers and practitioners uh, that worked for me that did a lot of the the day to day stuff, and I could still interact with clients. And so I kind of was it was a great complement to what I had done in the past, and it's been fun so far. I love it. Now the idea of purchasing a business, how did you determine the worth of that business you were acquiring? How did you establish this is what you're willing to pay for it? It's a good question, Roger. I, you know, typically in my background, you know, you look at multiples of EBITDA, right? Uh -huh. And I learned quickly as I did some homework that, you know, finance and accounting firms, while that is a key indicator, really it's a, you know, a, a multiple of revenue. And that was strange to me and bizarre. I thought, well, wait, is that is that right? But it really is right. It's you know anywhere from 0.9 to 1.5 if it's really really good uh, of revenue. And so, um, yeah, that's what I learned what the value was. And so this particular business that I that I acquired, I, I looked to see what the uh, annual revenues were and and felt like the price was fair. And so I made an offer and it was accepted. Excellent. Now, that process, how long did it take you from first becoming aware of the business being maybe open to being sold to now making the transaction final and you acquiring the company? How, how long of a time period? It was a pretty, not tremendously lengthy due diligence process. I wanted to do my due diligence because it was my own capital that I was investing in the mm -hmm. business. And uh, there's some personal risk that you take on with that, right? And yeah. so I wanted to do some due diligence. I would say, let's see, so I, the acquisition took place on August 1st of 21. And uh, I started those conversations around April. So uh, that's when it came to me and I did some due diligence and I looked into some things and went and interviewed. Well, there's a whole lot of steps that I went through to, to acquire, but I would say to answer your question directly, it was around four months or so. Excellent. Now, when someone's selling the business, there's a, very, a variety of motivations to sell the company, retirement, health situations, family. There's a variety of things. When this particular owner was leaving, did they want to stay around an immediate exit? Did they ex did you expect them to stick around for a period of time as part of the transition? What was that that process like for you? Really, really good question. And I I feel was a I landed into something that was really unique and something that fit me personally well, which was the individual that was selling the business wanted to remain in the business. And she wanted to remain as a practitioner. So she, her strength was she's very good with clients, brilliant at what she does. She's an EA or an enrolled agent, mm -hmm. um, has just built this business almost by, not by accident because of who she was, but it, it got above and beyond the business management component of it was above and beyond what she wanted to do. She yeah. wanted to continue to love on and um, service the clients that she's built over time and also take some time to be with her family and to dwindle down. So she said, Hey, I'm not, I'm not interested in selling to get out. I'm interested to just get out of the business management component of it. And, and so part of that decision-making process for me was seeing if it was an individual that I could work with uh -huh. that I'd want to work with and would I hire? And the answer is an absolutely resounding yes. I mean, she's phenomenal. Uh, she's a joy to work with. She's brilliant at what she does. And so um, I think we found a great relationship where she sold the business and, and um, I do that day to day, the business management of it, the hiring, the firing, all of those decisions, the, the tech stack, all of those things that we do. And she's able to continue to work with the client base that she's built up over time. And and uh, yeah. And so 
Uh, we'll see where it goes after a year. I, I wondered we, we when I bought the business, we made it a, a year agreement. She would stick around for a year. We'd see where it went, and then we re-upped that uh, because it's going so well. We mutually agreed that it is going well, and we want to continue that relationship. So I hope it goes for a long term. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. So it was very very unique because a lot of times when you buy a business, the owner is ready to exit or do something different, mm -hmm. and uh, she wanted to remain. Which to me, I I didn't want to be a tax practitioner, but. Um, uh, so it's and she didn't want to be a business owner, and so uh, it was a great little uh, combination and business relationship that we formed. Perfect. Now I'm curious: did she retain any equity in the business? She did not. Okay. She did not. She did a full 100% sale of the business, and um, as a part of that, came on as a, a, a an employee. So she signed an employment agreement to remain on there, and so. Um, yeah, that's a little unique because, you know, when you get an SBA loan, things like that, though, they, there are certain requirements, right. About how owners, uh, previous owners are, are not a part. And so uh, this was not, this was structured a bit differently so that we can retain yeah. her as a part of the business. Yeah. I definitely say it's, it's unique. It's not the common thing I've ex no. experienced. Uh, most business owners mentally check out and there's the, one of the motivations to leave the business before they kind of tank it. So. Uh, to see that she's very eager about remaining, staying involved, engaged, and has done so is incredible. So that's great. Um, how about culture? Uh, obviously, you're coming into a business that's already established, has employees. These employees have relationships with the clients. You're looking at it as you're assessing the value of the business as to whether or not this is also a culture you can kind of move into. Um, tell us about that transition of August 1, you acquire the business, now you're the boss. Uh, how did the employees take it? How did they take the news that she was selling the business? Yeah, good question. So part of my due diligence and why it took a little bit of time was I felt it was important that I understood the culture. Um, you know, I wanted to make sure that it was a good uh, a culture that I was aligned with and that they would be aligned with me. So I, I do knew I knew that when I acquired the business, there was you know, in an acquisition, asset acquisition, mm -hmm. you're acquiring, you know, the client base, but you're also acquiring the team members and, um, and what they do. So I, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews and she allowed me to do that. So mm -hmm. I, and she was comfortable with that. So they got to know me, I got to know them. And as a part of the interview process, I just asked, you know, some really bold questions such as, you know, what do you think about working here? How's it, what's it like working with the owner? What's it like working with your teammates? Um, what is, what do you envision the company being? And so, uh, I shared also my vision. I said, if I go through with this and um, we, 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 I acquired the firm, this is kind of what I vision. And, and so I got a feel that uh, most of them would be aligned with me. And so that gave me a lot of comfort. So when I came in, I realized I didn't want to ruffle feathers. I knew it was already there. And I, I wanted to seek to understand first um, rather than to be understood. I think that's really important. I didn't want to rock the apple cart. Uh, I think we had some things going and, and going well. However, they had reached kind of capacity, whether the technology they were using had reached capacity or uh, just, um, you know, yeah, there were some challenges uh, that come with a growing business. And yeah. it was a rapidly growing business. And uh, so with growth comes some some growing pains. And yeah. So I didn't want to make any changes and I didn't make any dramatic changes uh, for the first little while. Uh, I wanted to make sure that culture was maintained and that I understood how that culture, culture was run, whether that was even the meetings themselves, how frequent those meetings were with the entire team and how that was done. So uh, it, it's a great culture and it continues to be a great culture. It's a very collaborative. She's um, she's instilled a very collaborative culture, uh, a culture of more of in the office. I know we're in a time <laughs> now where it's outside the office is oh, kind yeah. of the buzz as well as offshoring. Yeah. And I think that makes sense for others, but for our particular firm uh, in the culture that we have, us being together and helping each other is, is really important. So uh, we have not really changed the culture at all. I think it's very much aligned with how I like to work and aligned with how she's built the company over time. Perfect. This is, you're giving a lot of great information here. So you alluded to change, whether or not there was going to be change with you taking the helm and, and starting uh, that position. Um, I'm curious, were there any sacred cows? What I'm referring to is sometimes someone in that transition says, here are some things that I really ask that you not change. Was there anything like that where she was maybe direct or emphatic of these things need to remain as they are? No, she's been nothing but graceful, nothing but realizing uh, you know, who becomes the boss, but it, we haven't really had that kind of boss employee relationship. It's been almost like a, um, a partnership, um, in spite of, you know, ownership and equity has changed. Um, she, she 
was very open and saying, you, you know, this is your company, you run it as you as you see fit. But even last night we had a you know a company party, we had a holiday party. I wanted to do that early rather than later, so we uh-huh. did it November thirtieth. Uh, but um, she just talked about, hey, hey, I appreciate that you haven't done it, and you haven't destroyed the company, you've actually grown it, and things are going really well. So excellent. Um, there was nothing really sacred. I think she. She had a heart of gold. Uh, she loved the team members that she had brought on board and how she had treated them. I think she felt r- really wanted to see how I would treat them. And so, um, yeah, that if there was anything, I guess I would say, it would probably be the team members that she had. Good. Okay. And then you also alluded to hybrid and offshore. So let's talk, talk about hybrid. Uh, there are a lot of changes that came because of COVID, a lot more remote type work, uh, hybrid type work schedules. How has that you know affected your office? It sounds like you actually work in the office. For the most part, we do. Good. I have a couple of roles that we have that are outside, but um, it it speaks to it's kind of a loaded question because it speaks to a little bit of the demographics of of who I hire. So I have some very seasoned um, professionals, but I also have some who I'm willing to train. Um, you know, it, it, the bookkeepers, right? So yeah. uh, this means uh, I have one who's a great individual who said, look, I'm going to go study accounting. I don't know much about accounting, but I know I like it. Uh, is there a place for me? And I said, you know what? There, There is a role for you. Let's come on. Let's train you. Let's teach you. And so uh, in order to be able to um, have that type of demographic of experience, it does require some in office handholding, not, not only that, but also mentoring, mm-hmm. um, coaching. And I do believe that that is so much better uh, handled in a face-to-face environment. And so given our employee demographic in that um, and where I've located my office, it makes it very easy to do so. But uh, we have had uh, sometimes, you know, we do have remote work at times. Um, some of my payroll stuff uh, that can be done, it's very repetitive, uh, that can be done. Somebody that uh, is a working mom, for example, um, that one is, is at home. But for the most part, I would say about 90% of my positions are in the office. Fascinating. You know, I, like you, have a kind of a unique situation. I've got some employees that work remotely, that work from their homes, but my preference still is having them work in the office. I think there's such a dynamic that occurs in the office that otherwise doesn't take place with people that are rarely seen, if seen, they're over a Zoom or a Google Meet or something. And so I, I like what you just shared there simply because of the fact that we're all having to deal with it. That That's something that I think is just naturally going to be asked by the interviewee. Can I work from home? I think these are things that we're all facing. I don't I don't see it going away anytime soon. Uh, you brought up offshoring as well. Do you have any thoughts or um, insights on that? Roger, I, I, I've thought about it, but um, I haven't pulled the trigger on that, meaning I haven't um, really explored it because of how things are working for me. And I love, yeah. I fear uh, for the culture. To me, culture is extremely important. I mm-hmm. think it's who we are. It's the client, um, who we, who we are to our clients as well. And so uh, I, it may be the point one day where we have to go there, but right now I've been able to satisfy the demand and bring on team members that are here. Um, I, I'm not opposed to offshoring. I mean, in my corporate career, we did all sorts of things mm-hmm. um, to save cost and also to, uh, we had for IT support, for example, was around the sun. So having IT hubs around the globe. So 24 seven, someone who was awake working on something that's great. In this particular environment, though, in this professional services environment, um, it, it may be some of the more basic things can be done offshoring. However, I would prefer to handle that somebody you know here locally in my current time zone. Um, though time zone it can be overcome, by the way. Um, going back to my corporate career, Costa Rica, for example, we off, offshored some things in Costa Rica, which is almost the exact same time zone as where we were. And it was great. So I'm not overly opposed to it. I have not implemented it yeah. uh, for various reasons uh, yeah. because I haven't reached that point now uh, of not being able to find the talent to get the job done. Yeah, it's interesting. I've known numerous individuals that were not so eager to go the offshoring route. And with the unemployment rate being what it is and the difficulty in hiring people with the demand growing their business, a lot of people have found themselves as as moving that direction. And some have had some very pleasant experiences finally making that leap. So uh, kind of an interesting uh, question that some people face sooner or later. Um, I'll have to look at it. Yeah. Well, you've got experience with it. So I, I trust that you'll um, do the right due diligence, I guess. Uh, here's a question. You've got your CFO, uh, $2 billion background and experience. And now you're working with clients that I presume are a little bit smaller. Uh, Mm -hmm. What kind of experiences have you noticed are different working with uh, 
different companies, smaller companies that you've enjoyed and liked? Um, I think there's some similarities and there's some differences. I mean, from a similar standpoint, I mean, uh, understanding balance sheets and income statements and and drivers, it, that principle is the same. Uh, understanding, I call them levers, right? Yep. What are the levers that you have to pull? And um, our client base, a lot of them are uh, franchisees. So they are beholden to a franchisor that has rules, regulations, certain things that they can and can't do. Pricing, they have no control over, for example. Mm -hmm. So this, some things that are very similar uh, from what I did before is you understand the levers of what you what you can control. How do you optimize your P&L? How do you find inefficiencies in the P&L? Um, that's all kind of the same. Uh, the differences are the numbers, the scale is a little bit different yep. <laughs> on the number side, uh, less zeros, but it all is kind of the same. Um, I, you know, some of the differences that I found is, um, you know, these are entrepreneurs that are doing, you know, umpteen things and they don't have as much time to dedicate into, you know, you know, fancy reporting or the in-depth understanding of their business. They're just trying to make sure the lights are kept on. They have enough staff to keep things going and they have enough inventory and they can meet, you know, and I, I sympathize and empathize with them. And mm -hmm. so I think the big difference, which goes to your question is, is they have to know a lot about a lot of things. The breadth of their understanding is there. And so I think where we can come in and help is they like, let me help you on this side of the house, which is on your number side, on the business side, let me highlight some things and some levers that are you know, opportunities for you um, to look at uh, where you can control. I, li I like how you describe that because similarly, I would describe it as they're wearing more hats than the larger organizations typically have. Mm -hmm. uh, they're as smaller entities, they're in a situation where those multiple hats require you as you interact with them to address those various roles that they're trying to take care of. So uh, that's how I've seen it myself. But your point was very true to say, the balance sheet just has more zeros. The PL just has more zeros. What you're looking at more is just the ratios. The ratios are tried and proven. They're just business principles. We're looking at those margins, those ratios, and we're managing accordingly to try and increase or improve each of those. So yeah, well said. Um, let me ask the um, myths associated with owning a business like you do, where you're running the successful accounting and tax service business. Is there a common myth that someone has of you? For example, tax season, you're always busy. <laughs> huh, let me think. Myths. I think the myth might be is uh, owning your own business is great. You're your own boss and there's no, there's not as much stress. I There is. Um, it, the stress is just different, right? I think yeah. there are some luxuries that are there as you compare to the corporate world uh, than what you had before. But I think the myth that it's just easy peasy is is not not there. I Thank mean, you. Uh, you, you know, you, sometimes your mind doesn't shut off, even for Thanksgiving break, right? I was trying to, I'm with my family, but my mind's churning about various things that I should be doing or things I should be changing or what am I doing wrong? How can I, uh, how have I interacted with this employee better? How, you know, all those kind of things. Completely um, relate, by the way. <laughs> right. I mean, these are myths, like it's so much easier when you're on business, you're a, you're a business owner. And I think uh, it's just different stress, but um I, I like it a little bit better for the fact that uh, it's, you know, it's me. It's my own skin in the game, but it is fun. I'm having a great time doing it. But I think that was a, be a big a big myth is that it's it's easy as a business owner. And it's not. It's almost like you never have that turn off or shut off time. Yeah. Uh, it, when you work for a business, it's like, okay, yeah, I'll get to that tomorrow. And sometimes you're able to shut off your mind a little bit more. But when it's your own business, no. Yep. The yeah. uh, analogy I'll sometimes give is that of chess. I just think there's a lot of strategy, a lot of gameplay. It's a lot of mind. You're just processing a lot of things and you're trying to see, okay, if I do this, what's that next move going to then look like thereafter? And yeah, I, I enjoy it as well. So it's kind of fun. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's considering either purchasing a business like you have, merging with another accounting firm? What did you learn in that process that you could give as advice? Uh, I would do, so due diligence is not, uh, under eight. I mean, it, you should do your due diligence. Um, make sure it's something that's aligned with what you want. Uh, you know, I wanted, I had some criteria I'd set before when I buy a business and I, I was able to check those boxes and go into it. Um, it may not, maybe not a hundred percent of those boxes, but most of them should be checkable. Um, so that you, uh, yeah, that it that it works for you. And there's a lot of businesses that are out there. I mean, you can go to business brokers. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are trying to sell, and 
it may or may not be the right fit for you and who you are and what you want. Perfect. Let's talk about the business itself. Um, it's accounting and tax services. Uh-huh. Uh, give us an idea of what that looks like. Do you have uh, accounting department, tax department, working with accounting clients, tax clients? We've spoken of professional services. Do you offer any CFO and advisory type services? Just give us an idea of what that looks like for you. So we've um, our focus is really on a. We have various demographics, a customer, our client demographics, but. The, the main one that we have is, like I mentioned, uh, franchisees. Correct. So we have there, it's very similar. And so what that's mean, what that means for us is that we can have process. And that that's another thing, you know, when I acquired the business, I was very comfortable with is because I, I'm a big process guy. I, I believe that you something that's repeatable um, and, and it's something you can put in place like that. You're less air prone and you can provide a high quality service and you find efficiencies in doing so. So um, it started out really as everyone was everything. Uh, and that's, if there's one change that I made, it's, it's moving towards more of a specialized group. And so uh, it was hard if you take somebody that's bookkeeper and they're going to do bookkeeping and they're going to do payroll, they're going to do all of these things. Mm-hmm. It, that, that's a very steep learning curve. However, if you're able to specialize and then help them transition and learn other things as well, then you can, you can move forward and, and, and help them progress. But what Certus provides is we primarily do bookkeeping, bookkeeping services. Mm-hmm. And we are bookkeepers for various clients. And that also then dovetails into various things. Uh, we secondly, we do sales tax. So as we do the bookkeeping, we finish up the sales tax. We know all the revenue stuff that needs to happen. And uh, we do sales tax in various states uh, okay. for these clients. Um, as they're, you know, we have to understand their point of sale system, how that works. Um, so we do sales tax for them. We do bookkeeping for them and we pay their people. So we manage their payroll. And so, um, with this particular franchisee, they have, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 employees and they are rotating, um, as they come, you know, they're either high school students or college students yeah. or things like that. And so we manage the payroll and bringing people on board and paying them on a weekly basis. So bookkeeping, sales tax, payroll, and then that also then moves into the other side of the business, which is income tax preparation um, and income tax advisory. Um, okay. So uh, that piece of the business, the income tax, um, was really how the business began. It originated by doing income taxes and that bookkeeping was kind of on the side to help on the the seasonal, Very keep common. the cash flow, keep the cash flow coming throughout the year, right? Yes, uh, yes. Rather than the pops that come during tax season. So we do do some income taxes as well. And we are trying to find a little more time to be more on the advisory side, also with these clients, rather than just do their income tax preparation. Um, as I've come in, uh, I've offered some uh, CFO advisory services. I've done some consulting there. That piece of the business is in development. To be frank, uh, we haven't moved for, I, I need the resources to do that. And you know, and I, frankly, I've been pretty busy on over this, I, it's hard to believe that a year and a half's gone by almost here, but <laughs> just getting infrastructure in place and yeah. process in place and the hiring and the firing. And, um, you know, we've, we've doubled the business since I bought it. So, and it's all been kind of the same on that, those same silos that I talked about, bookkeeping, sales tax, payroll, mm-hmm. uh, and some income tax preparation. And so I do believe there's a great opportunity for us to expand there. And I know clients are screaming for that. Yeah. Um, we've moved, um, even some of the bookkeepers in the output and the deliverable, I've tried to make that more polished. I want to have it something that is, uh, uh, rather than just a QuickBooks output file, it's it's very much a polished deliverable of multiple pages of ana- analytics mm-hmm. that I've had in there. It's kind of my FP&A background, uh, financial planning and analytics, and we've added, included some of that so that um, by default, they have some of that as a part of their deliverable, um, even without subscribing to the advisory services. I do believe mm. that's a pretty important retention tool is I don't want to be just a bookkeeper. I want to be somebody that provides them information, not just data or a compilation of their data into, you know, gap uh, required, you know, balance sheet mm-hmm. and income statements yeah. and cash flow statements. I want to have something that they can look at that deliverable and read it. And so that a non-finance person or accounting person can say, oh, okay, he's bringing up to point some ratios here. I should be looking at these ratios. And so it's not a ratio about everything, but um, that that deliverable is um, the the start, I believe, in forming that relationship that's more long term, uh, and uh, that we can open up more of those advisory services where they have appointments with me and say, let's let's open up this deliverable now. Let's talk about it for the next hour. Let's highlight some of those things where you have opportunities, some of the levers that you can pull. 
I love how you've described that. It's very much similar to the conversations I'm having with other owners as they determine what is that next thing that they're going to be providing to their clients. You, you mentioned a value add, bringing in a little bit more of those analytics for the business owner, giving them the information that the bookkeeping is providing for them to be able to make more informed business decisions. So the easiest way I've looked at describing it in the conversation is that there's three core services that a firm is able to focus on when providing accounting, bookkeeping, CFO type services. You've got the accounting, the bookkeeping, you've got the tax preparation, the tax planning, you've got the CFO and advisory. So those six things make up the three core areas and you've described them very well because I think what you're, you're uh, alluding to or even said, the business owners are needing it. They're they're eager for it. They're craving it. And we're needing as an accounting profession to step in and really fill those voids and address those needs that they have. So well done in, in, in identifying that and moving towards it. Uh, I'm going to now go to a little bit more personal side of this. Okay. So in, in going personal, uh, we've got a number of things I want to address. I'm going to go back to buying the business. Here you are, you're retired, you're skiing, you're you're golfing, you're enjoying life, you're perhaps at home, as you you mentioned, and you come to your wife and you say, "Hun, I've got a great idea. I want to take this nest egg of ours and I want to go buy a business. Mm -hmm. And it's a sizable nest egg and I'm going to go buy it and I'm going to be an accounting business. What was the reaction? What's the support been like? What has she been for you as you've been going through this journey this last year and a half? Um, she's, she's incredible. Uh, she's my rock. I, she has put the utmost trust in, in me. Um, and uh, so that conversation is, you know, she says, okay, if you think this is right, let's do it. And having a partner that is supportive is, is crucial um, to, to moving forward and doing that. And um, it's a little bit scary. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is taking some of your personal capital, yep. uh, some of that nest egg, as you say, and saying, okay, we're going to plop this down um, for an opportunity to, to learn and grow. And we've not, built a business we've not mm -hmm. owned a business like this before yeah. and let's go and she was incredibly supportive and continues to be so she's always been supportive and uh, we've moved around the world um and she's been supportive of me and i have nothing but gratitude immense gratitude for her and for my kids um you know we lived in central america for a while uh, for a company um worked for a company and i was the uh, head of finance over latin america and so you'd think okay that's great central america panama that's that's going to be pretty easy. Not, not mm -hmm. too bad. Well, what makes it, and we both speak Spanish, so that makes it a little bit easier. What makes it a little more challenging was that uh, this was about 80 to 90% travel. So any given week, I could have been in Argentina, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Peru, you name them, Mexico. We were all over Latin America. We wow. were for tax reasons that we were in Panama. Uh -huh. So my family, she likes to say, we lived in, I lived in Panama. He visited me there when he wasn't working, um, which is somewhat true. Because, um, but uh, she's, uh, I give that example just to show how supportive she was. We've moved all over the country and all over the world doing various things. And, um, it's been nothing but support. Um, I have a girl from new England. Uh, I, she grew up in new England. I grew up in Utah. We come together, we meet in college and she's been with me all the way. And we're going to, uh, actually in a couple of days, we'll, we'll celebrate our, the 25th anniversary of our first date. Oh so my. we're pretty thrilled. It's a big year for us. 25 years. She put up with me. Yeah. Well, yeah. first of all, congratulations. And that, Thank you. that, that uh, narrative that you shared of that support, so often I find that to be true. There's got to be someone there that's in your corner, that's your cheerleader, that basically allows you to kind of lean on. And I, I like that you have that. How about your children? What are you hoping that they're learning as they watch you go from the corporate world, doing the travel like you did? Uh, now you're in a position where you're owning and operating and running a business. What do you hope that they're learning or have learned from this? I hope they're seeing that the, the sky's the limit. There are no limitations to what somebody can do. Uh, you just have to have a passion and you have to work hard. Um, you know, I learned it from my father. My father was a, a teacher. He taught special ed for 35 plus years, but he was one of the hardest workers and is the hardest worker that I know. And, um, you know, I don't think I'm the sharpest tool in the shed, <laughs> but I was the guy that was in the library in college, you know, on Friday nights trying to get, uh, you know, understand concepts and doing pro math problems and those kind of things. And I hope my kids have seen that both me and their mom are hard workers. And um, it doesn't matter. You can kind of outwork. Some people are, are a lot smarter than me or us, uh, and that's okay. Uh, yeah. We can work. They're not going to outwork us, that's for darn sure. I hope they're seeing that. I'll hopefully they're seeing, too, that there's you can survive in society in various, various professions. Um, 
even taking a break from the corporate world or uh, saying I'm done with the corporate world and going and owning your own business. And I hope they don't have to go into business either. My oldest son, he's preparing to get, uh, he wants to get accepted into medical school. So wow, uh, that'll be great. And that's fine. If he's not in business, he's in med. He likes all that chemistry and those kind of things. Yeah. And, that's not me, but I'm more of a numbers guy. Uh, but I hope they're seeing that hard work uh, is is one of the most important qualities, and that the, there is there are no limitations. You know, the just the fact that you brought up hard work makes me happy because I think that's something that should be emphasized more and more. That is truly, I feel, one of the keys to success uh, in my career. It's it's I was willing to show up earlier than everyone else and stay longer than everyone else, work harder, but it's being dependable, it's showing up, just being there. And I think that's more than most people in the, in the, in the workforce, unfortunately. So if you can just show up, be there early, stay a little longer, it really makes a difference. That extra half hour a week, that gives you two and a half hours, or excuse me, an extra half hour a day gives you that extra two and a half hours a week over someone else's productivity and it can really add up quickly. So I, just a big deal. And that's, if I can, if I can just interject here a little bit too, is when you're looking for talent, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a resume can talk about whether they have an EA or a CPA or they have, you know, certification in QuickBooks. Yeah, that's, that's great. But what I really look for too is that grit, that, yeah. uh, that hard work ethic. And I, I have had people come to me and say, look, like I, I already explained a little bit. Somebody said, I don't know accounting. I have not used QuickBooks, but I'm going to go right now. I'm going to figure this out in the next two weeks. I'm going to go try to figure this, you know, self-certify and, yeah. and I'm, and those are the kind of people like, you know what, we, we can mentor you. And because of the office environment that we have, um, we have mentors and I have, I can't have that with every position for sure. I have to have some skilled individuals in there, but I, I will take that any day. Somebody that has that grit, that determination, that hard work ethic, because I know it'll stick and mm -hmm. they'll learn and they're hungry. Uh, that hungry, uh, that hunger is, is really important. Yeah. Uh, I read a book. Uh, we read a book when I was in um, my last corporate job when I was CFO that was really, really good. It, it talked about three principles of or qualities of an of hiring. Okay. And that is hungry, humble, and smart. It's called The Ideal Team Player. Okay. Um, great, great book for anyone that's looking to hire somebody. I, obviously, I don't get any endorsements from this, but uh, <laughs> this is something I subscribe to. And I had, it's one of the first books that I have my team read. We have a book club. It's optional. And uh, we read various books, business books that I've read throughout my career. And I, I buy them for the team and we read them and at a team meeting, we just discuss them. Um, and that was what, the first one that I had them read. Uh, it's a little fable, but it's a good one. Um, I remember the author, I think Lincioni, I think this might be his last okay. name. Uh, but uh, we look for individuals that are humble, that are hungry and that are smart. So anyway, I, I love it. So I also, I don't currently have this going on, but I have in my staff meetings done a book club where each of us as members would suggest a book. And then as we went through reading the book, we would discuss it and its application to the office and their personal lives. I've had phenomenal conversations that have come from those books. And honestly, I've read books that I would never have picked up because of the suggestions someone else in the groups, uh, you know, made. It was their choice to recommend a book and by darn, they gave a book and I never would have picked it up. And it was incredible. And, and it really did change some of the things that we were doing in the office. So uh, great suggestion. Thanks for offering it. Uh, let's ask about uh, you and your childhood. Give me a childhood memory, a favorite memory. There's, there's a lot. I had a great childhood. I had great parents, um, taught me great principles and who loved me. I knew no matter what I did wrong, I, that would actually brings up the memory, uh, we lived a little bit on a farm. So okay. my, my grandpa had a dairy farm that he ended up selling, but we lived next door to my grandpa and my uncle lived next door to him. And so we were all kind of in the same area in, Beautiful. In, in here. And so we had tractors and, um, and even when I was before, you know, driving age, I, my dad had me on the tractor helping do stuff. I remember lifting him up in a, in a, um, loader bucket to pick apples and to do things. And my job was to raise it up and move it over and drive them. Anyway, the particular experience was he asked me once to go get the tractor. And so I'm pretty excited, right? I don't know. I'm maybe 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Maybe it was like 13, something like okay. that. Go get the tractor. He needed it. So I, I was excited. So he's like, yeah. So I went over and I got the tractor and I thought I was, you know, I was pretty confident because I'd driven it a bunch of times. And, but when you have a tractor that has a loader bucket, there's a lot of, uh, space at the front before you back back up. And so what I didn't realize was there was a vehicle that was next to um, next to this uh, tractor. So I backed up and turned that wheel and backed words in. Then I took that loader bucket and it scraped oh. all along the side of the car. And it was uh, like my uncle's car or something like that. So I was pretty nervous. So I got the tractor to my dad and then I just ran. 
and I went and hid. And I, uh, I remember just being mortified thinking, okay, my life is over. I've just ruined this car. And, um, my dad didn't get mad. He just, um, he just said, we'll take, we'll fix it. We'll fix it. We'll figure this out. And he loved me. And, uh, that to me is a great example of a, of a parent's love, of patience, mm-hmm. of treating a situation. I mean, he knew financially it was going to cost some money. Um, he really knew that I was hurt, that I didn't do it on purpose. And, um, you know, I think that's human interaction. We need more of that. We need more of love and understanding that people are going to make mistakes. And uh, that uh, I, that's something that's really just been instilled in me forever as I know that my dad loves me in spite of what I do. Yeah. He has a great love for me. So. That's a childhood memory that comes to mind. Um, probably have others, but that's that's one. Not to get all sentimental and everything else, but uh, uh, that is one that I know my parents loved me, and uh, so I had a great childhood, and they taught me some great principles. And growing up, growing up on a farm where you have corn and um, other things around is not a bad way to to learn hard work. Excellent. I appreciate you sharing that story. I think the importance of family is immense. It's huge for me. It's something I emphasize in my own home. Uh, that family is everything. And uh, so I can hear that in what you're sharing. And the other thing is I love how what you're describing after the fact is this safe environment. It provides so much opportunity to learn if that safe environment exists. And and parents, I as parents, I want my kids to feel as if that safe environment exists with me. I'm hoping that they can bring their challenges, their struggles, their problems with the understanding that I'm not going to judge and criticize, but I'm going to help. And so I, I, I liked what you shared. Um, you used the word love a few times. I'm going to, I do this all the time with family and friends. So um, give me a synonym that you feel represents the word love. What does love mean? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I, the first thing that comes to mind, I don't know if it's a synonym, is unconditional. Okay. Um, I think love doesn't have any uh, if statements. Okay. That should be attached to it. Yeah. I think love is um, comes with the good and the bad. Uh, it's you know I talked about I'm having 25 years. My wife has overlooked some of my bad stuff for so long. Yeah. And I love her for that. And you know she's not perfect. I um, no one marries perfection they marry potential yeah and um that's a quote that i that i love to live by but um yeah i don't know i don't know i, th- I think love just needs to be accompanied by unconditional like it truly is love if uh is not love if, if there's conditions attached to it uh, it needs to be that you give of yourself freely and um, that you're willing to accept people for their who they are and in yeah. spite of decisions that they make sometimes that's hard yeah uh, sometimes they make decisions that hurt but i think love is true when it's unconditional. That's beautiful. I, I, in addition to unconditional, I'd say without qualifiers, I, I don't ever want my kids to think they have to qualify for my love, that, that there's something they have to do in order to uh, feel loved. And so I, I really like that. Um, mm-hmm. My word, by the way, is commitment. Okay. I, I've seen, like you said, my wife has seen my faults and my failing failings and she's been there. I, I have no doubt she's committed. I have no reservation as to whether or not she's by my side. And uh, that to me is love when I can look at someone and realize that they're, they're in it, good or bad, always going to be there. I don't have to question whether or not the, the person's going to be there. And I think that of a lot of people in my life. So well said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you brought up holiday. You had a holiday party yesterday. Uh, the time of year we're recording this, it's the holiday season. So I'm going to ask, what's your favorite holiday? Oh, wow. All of them. No. <laughs> um, I think we, we love Christmas time. Um, I think Christmas is, is a time where you slow down. I think Christmas is a time where you, you reflect and, you know, I am, I am Christian. So therefore Christmas is really important to me as I reflect on, you know, my own spiritual uh, side of the house. I, I do believe that balance in life is important. You need to have, you can't work yourself to the grave. You need to have balance of family. You need to have balance with spiritual. You need to have balance with that. And so to me, Christmas is a time to just kind of stop and reflect. You know, there's, there's music that's associated with Christmas. There's memories that are associated with Christmas that brings families together. Um, and you, you take time off work to really reflect on what's important. And so, yeah, I love this time of year. It's, it's great when we start thinking about, um, you know, Christmas and the holidays and, 
uh, being together. That's beautiful. I couldn't agree more. I love the music. Uh, Christmas is a big time for me. Uh, that Thanksgiving to Christmas to New Year's, this is the time of year that I just absolutely love and enjoy. I love the weather. I love the changing of the seasons. I love the time with family. I, I love the feel. And uh, there's a giving element to it. You, you just want to help other people. So, so many great things. Um, how about a movie? Do you have a favorite movie associated with holiday, with the holiday? Favorite movie associated with the holiday? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit, I guess I would say naughty sometimes, but it's uh, the Christmas, uh, Nap National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh, excellent choice. Um, it has some raunchy things in there, but we have to kind of <laughs> overlook those. But we as a family, we, we speak those phrases. Uh, we laugh. My wife and I laugh at that one. You just can't go wrong with, with Christmas Vacation and Chevy Chase. <laughs> so I just saw it literally like two, three days oh, ago. So I'm curious, what favorite scenes do you have? Oh, let me count that. I mean, there's so many. Just from the very opening one where they're driving. <laughs> to get the tree. Uh, to get the tree. <laughs> and then they get the tree. And then they open the tree in the house. Uh, their interaction <laughs> with their neighbors. Neighbors, Margo, I think. I have a sweater that says, um, we, we, we. my wife has one. Is why is the carpet all wet, Todd? And then mine says, <laughs> I don't know, Margo. I mean, that's a phrase from the, <laughs> yeah, it is. From the, from the show. Um, all There's so many great scenes. And then when Cousin Eddie shows up there... Um, <laughs> As he put, turns the lights on, right? All mm -hmm. of a sudden, all of a sudden, Eddie is there. Um, you can't go wrong with that one where he's totally, Chevy Chase is totally surprised uh, that oh, Clark, Eddie. I guess, <laughs> Eddie's here. And then the dog's there and he has some sort of uh, sinus condition. The dog's, so he's like, hey, you better not pet the dog. And this, they call him snots or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I could go on. And, uh, I don't want to hijack your whole show, but that's, there's some great scenes. In oh, it's beautiful. And the endearing love that they have for the family members, the quirky family members. And yeah, it's beautiful. Grandma what? wraps up the cat. I mean, <laughs> brings the cat. You know, and the, that's right. The lime jello's coming out of the out of the present and Eddie licks it. And, oh, that's good. Actually, he doesn't lick his own finger. I think he licks uh clark's wife's finger <laughs> so yeah. one of my favorite i mean there's like you said numerous scenes in there that are excellent but one of my favorite that i always point out is i love how eddie wears the dicky do you know what a dicky is uh -huh. i know exactly what it is i it's had one down. yeah i had one of those as a kid i wore that turtleneck that was cut out that you would wear underneath a sweater and i wore that all the i remember wearing that to family things parties and so forth so i had one and to see him wear that and he's got that white sweater on that allows you to see through it's the see green dicky yeah. oh i just think it's just hysterical as he drinks the eggnog out of the moose, moose. head cup uh-huh one of these days i'm going to get those i always say watch that and say i'm going to get those cups but uh i've anyway. actually seen them i don't own them but i have seen them I so it's funny excellent this <laughs> that was a, a good uh journey down memory lane there i enjoyed that uh tell me about someone influen influential in your life that really impacted who you are that was kind of a mentor who are they what did they instill in you um well, I already talked about my parents. I, I I would highlight that one for sure. I think they've been great mentors to me just ab about life. I mean, they're not business people, mm -hmm. but I think the principles can be applied, uh, the things that they taught me. Um, that would be my first choice of a mentor. Um, you know, the spiritual aspect of my life is extremely important to me. Uh, I think uh, the, they are all mentors. I would say, you know, Jesus Christ is one of those mentors for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I know for others, it's it's other individuals uh, religiously, but for me, those principles um, are tried and true, and I'd like to be better at that. Uh, I think living those principles about, you know, we talked about love here today, mm -hmm. uh, I think of understanding, and um, so I think he, he for sure is one of those mentors, and as much I can read about him and his life and his teachings and principles, and that I can try to apply those in my life uh, is important to me. Uh, from a business side, um, I've had so many great mentors. I had one, um, his name was John Guttery. Uh, he was, he was great. When I, I mentioned Central America and Panama, mm -hmm. um, he was the president there and, um, uh, I was the head of finance and we worked together. We traveled the world and all the countries I mentioned before. And, um, he, he would take time, uh, just to, when it was unexpected to just mentor, uh, whether it was in an airport, whether we were sitting side by side in a, in an airplane, uh, whether at a, at a dinner, um, he just, he took time, but he did it. So in a way that was never judgmental, it was always in trying to help. And, and he would ideate and he would say, Hey, you know what, what do you think of this? I'm thinking this. And so he would bounce ideas off me. And so from a business side, that would be him. He's great. And I think now he's, we've all gone our different ways and he's in Minnesota today. And I uh, shout out to John out there, but he's a great mentor, man. Perfect. You know, I, 
likewise have business mentors, individuals that have helped me just kind of learn principles in business, be a little bit more uh, introspective as to decisions being made and and how it impacts employees and customers. So I, I like how you shared that. And I appreciate you mentioning your faith and bringing in uh, that element. I, I do believe that I'm likewise a much better person because of my faith, believing that that uh, as I do, that there is a God and that uh, in my faith also, also in Jesus Christ really does help me realize that I need to understand the decisions I make. I'm going to be accountable for them. And at some point, I do expect to stand be- before my maker and have to account for certain things that I've either said or done. And so it causes me to uh, want to be better do things differently, make amends when necessary. Um, and I feel that makes me a better person because I'm accountable for, for the things I'm doing. I'm not just doing it in a vacuum. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, we'll, so many great men have, you know, lived and given us principles. I mean, the prophet Muhammad has lived, has also given us some great principles to, to consider. And I think that balance, that spiritual balance helps yeah. us be better business people, helps us be better individuals, yep. um, and to leave a better legacy on the planet, um, to leave it a little bit better than what, than, how we came. I, I've, if I could expand on just a little bit further is, uh, you know, going back to that principle of my dad, I mean, he loved, I mean, he also was a spiritual man. And I know that he, he learned some of those principles, um, by being a spiritual individual. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we've made mistakes at Certus, uh, internally, we've made some mistakes that have impacted clients. There've been some financial mistakes that we've had to cover. There's, there's mistakes that, I think in the early part of my career, be, oh, those are fireable offenses. Like you cost the company X amount of dollars, like you're gone. I don't believe in that. I, I do believe uh, that, that those, those things, uh, and I want to create an environment where it's a safe place to make mistakes as long as we learn from them. Uh, you can't tolerate mediocrity, but you can tolerate the fact that we're all learning together and um, we use it as an opportunity, not as a, as a chance to demean anyone or anything, but let's say, hey, this is what happened. This is uh, what we're going to do to correct it. This is what we're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen in the future and move on from that. And that people realize that, oh, okay, hey, this is a safe place where I can mm-hmm. spread my wings and fly and I can take a little bit of risk here and there. Um, that's the kind of culture that I want to create. And I think those kind of principles that whether it came from my parents or from my own you know, spiritual background, I uh, hopefully I've tried to instill that in in the environment where we work at Certus. Yeah, I I, I like your application of those things in the business setting. That, that's a great example of it. My, my experience has been whenever I work with someone that's just simply God-fearing, uh, I, I tend to have a little bit better interaction with them only because I find that they make decisions similar to the way I would just because of that principle of believing there's something else. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, what You brought up failure just a second ago. What, what's a failure, a big failure that you've had that you've learned from? What was the lesson you learned from it? I think I made some failures like from my own personal investments here and there. Some have been succeeded really well. Some have, um, some have not, but part of that is, uh, I think you can trust people, but you also need to trust yourself Hmm. and you need to make sure you do your own due diligence and you have to feel comfortable with that. Um, for the most people, most part, people have pure motives. Uh, they're, they're great. I think people are great for the most part. There are some that are squirrely, I guess I would say, are out to do something for themselves. But I think I've learned uh, from my failures um, uh, to to trust in myself and to not totally um, trust 100% in others. I think you can Mm -hmm. trust reluctantly. I don't know what's the right way of saying that, but um, that's, that's what comes to mind. Yeah. Reagan's thing, trust but verify kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, you brought up travel earlier. Love travel. I also lived in South America. I was in Chile. So okay. love, love everything down there. Um, but in your travels, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Um, Not visit, live. Live. I like living where I like, where I live today. I've seen the world. I like traveling the world, but I like living here in Utah. And the reason is, is I like the seasons. I like to be able to change my wardrobe, but I also like the different sports that you can do here. Um, my wife does not like the cold. You know, we lived in Arizona for a long time, and she she reminds me around February or so. Uh, <laughs> you know, why why do we not have a place in Arizona again? Um, but I, I like the mountains here. I like um, I follow the local uh, local teams, uh, sports teams. So that's 
I'm a little bit of a sports nut there that I like to follow. And so yeah. being here local where I can go to and attend those events in person, it's important to me, as well as hitting the mountains in the summertime, um, as well as, you know, golfing in the summertime, as well as doing a little bit of skiing in the wintertime. I like the seasons, uh, but I, I love visiting a lot of places, uh, uh, whether it's Hawaii, whether it's Argentina, whether it's Chile, uh, whether it's Europe. Um, I, we love traveling the world, my wife and I. And uh, if, if we don't have in our Delta app a list of f- upcoming flights, we get a little anxiety because uh, we like to go see the world. I'm the exact same way. A, a trip a month. That's what I like to do. Yeah. Um, it's probably a bit aggressive, a bit much, but typically what I experience. And so I'll typically try to do at least one every six to eight weeks. So where's the last place you were? Last place I was in Hawaii. Okay. I was just there two weeks ago. Really? Which island? I was in uh, Oahu and then Kauai. Okay. Yeah. Good. Had an amazing trip. It was beautiful. Was there with family. And then just before that was the Dominican Republic. And I go to the DR this week. Oh, fun. That is one place of all of the, I have not been to the DR. We are looking forward to that. We were, we had something planned and then COVID hit. Oh, okay. So we had to cancel, but that's, that's on our bucket list is to get over there to Punta Cana and yep. those parts over there. That's where I'm headed. So there's a Haitian community center there that we support. We've hmm. been doing a few things there with the center and we've got a project that we're doing this next week and uh, just helping the local youth. Um, the Haitians, they're, they're uh, kind of estranged in the fact that they're like you would see illegal immigrants here in the United States. They're many, in many cases illegal there as well. It's an island and so they come over for a better living on the DR side as opposed to the Haitian side. And so there's some struggles that they're facing and we're hoping to address a few of them as best we can in helping. So that's Sounds what we're interesting. going to do. Yeah. Um, let's talk about visiting with someone. I always like this question. If you could meet with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? And what would you like to learn from them? Ask. I, I like to read biographies and my wife believes it's, that's why that's like watching paint dry, but, um, <laughs> uh, she thinks it's pretty boring, but I, you know, the reason I like biographies is because they don't get to become the individuals they are, uh, by chance. And, and, yeah. and you can see their, their, uh, the things they struggle with, those kind of things. The individual, I mean, this may sound like, oh, this is a cop. It's really somebody like George Washington. Um, you know, he he had to make some really important decisions with respect to leadership. Yeah. You know, it was very much a culture of kings. And, uh, you know, he when he made that decision after two terms to step down, that, that set a tremendous precedence for us as a country and as an mm-hmm. organization. But, you know, he was one that had a lot of failures. Uh, he was one, you know, I read that book, uh, about him and there's many books that have been written about him, but, uh, Ron Chernow. Um, so he, Ron Chernow a great author. He's the one that wrote Hamilton, by the way, that was yeah. inspired the, uh, the hit musical, but Ron Chernow also wrote about George Washington and he's, he's a fascinating individual. Um, he's one that I would willing to sit down at the table and just understand so much about what his thinking was on leadership, um, and how he was able to do what he did. Yeah. I have to agree with you. Um, I love the founding fathers, the reading that I've done of them, studying who they are, the imperfect people that they were made phenomenal decisions. And as I look at the founding of our country, I have to respect the fact that like the great compromise that occurred in Philadelphia, yeah. they, they, they had to make concessions and they knew that. And that to me was politicking at its best. And Honestly, it wasn't that the best came out of the perfect solution came out of it, but a compromise occurred and it allowed things to move forward. And it's what enabled this country to begin. And I'm so grateful for those sacrifices. And if you look at through the revolution, so many of them who lost their families, their treasure, they gave everything for this to happen. And I'm always in awe and humbled by that. And so to bring up George Washington, I likewise would love to sit down and just understand he could have taken the reins and done so much with it just out of pride, ego, ego, and so forth. And yet for some reason he was willing to see the bigger picture and see that the country was greater than him. So that's right. So, so amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, and I forgot to ask this because of your travels, instead of living, is there a favorite vacation, a particular place that you go? I'm a traveler. So I'm curious what you'd suggest. We have a couple go-tos. We like going diversity, but we, um, we like Cabo. 
okay. uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it won from Salt Lake. It's a, it's an easy direct flight on Delta. Yeah. It's like three and a half hours. Yeah. You can go there. It's a dry heat. It's kind of like Arizona. You get all the Mexican food, which is great. Uh, the Mexican culture and we both speak Spanish. So it's kind of like we're at home being there. It's a quick trip, easy to get there. Uh, we have that already booked for January. Just, uh, Make sure I get my wife some sunshine here in the winter. That's right. It gets her through. Um, and then we like Hawaii as well. So we like to go to Maui. We've been to a couple islands, but we really love Maui okay. um, as, as an island. And so those are two go-to is Cabo and Maui. Been to both, like both. So excellent choices. All right, good. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, books. We brought up books. Uh, you've recommended already one. Are there any like go-to books that you would suggest people read that you feel are very helpful in what you've been able to accomplish? Yeah, I mean the one that I already I already highlighted was um, was great. The other one that I did, the second book that I did for our team, was our iceberg is melting, hmm. and uh, it's a little book. It's something you can read and sit down in like an hour and, and finish it, maybe an hour and a half, uh, and it's got pictures. It has beautiful pictures about penguins and different things, and it's kind of written like a cartoon. I it's probably about ten years old, but it's one that impacted me. Just it's about the the, the principle of change and that. And, and things are evolving all around us. I mean, not to give away the whole book, but um, really it's about, in the title itself, our iceberg is melting. A group of penguins, they're just content as life is, but somebody kind of raises this flag and says, hey, I've done, I've gone underneath and see that something's happening here. Uh-huh. And uh, there's principles that are taught there about business, just knowing that uh, if if you're not evolving, you're, you're kind of dying. Yeah. And that's just the way business works and how capitalism works. And so I've tried to instill our team like, yeah, we can get comfortable. And we I, and I'm a big process guy. I love to have repeatable things uh, and process. However, we need to make sure that we have our sights set into the future to know what else is out there, that it's changing, whether your clients are looking for that next next thing. And sometimes people look too much for the ne- the other shiny object that's out there and, and they bounce around too much. However, I do believe that as entrepreneurs, they're always seeing what else they may be missing. And so I, I think uh, organizations and individuals should always understand the changes around them. And so that was a great book. Um, it's called Our Iceberg is Melting. I don't even remember the author. The author escapes me. That's but fine. It it's, reminds it's me. It's a little of, business fable, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of Who Moved My Cheese. It is. It's actually, I think it might be the same author. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Because uh-huh. it's the same premise. Yeah. And I, it's just... Uh, it might be the same author, but uh, somebody's going to look it up like and say, he doesn't a, know what he's talking about. But Yeah, it sounds like it's a climate change variation of who moved my cheese or who moved of. the cheese. Uh-huh. Yeah, so. They get committees together and they have, you know, different naysayers and, and people mocking them. It, 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 it's a good little. Yeah, I It brings up that. a good discussion. I mean, we read it as a team. Um, I made the assignment, gave them a month to read it. We came back, had a lunch, and just um, talked about it and talked about what application is. And so sometimes... The reason I like doing that and having book club as a part of a team, even though I do make it optional, is that you can all of a sudden something happens and you can reference that book. Yes. You can talk about, hey, this is the iceberg. And people know when you say that, they know exactly what you mean. And so yes. we learn together as a team. And um, I like that. Um, right now, um, we're reading The Seven Habits. We're going to do that over time. It's been years since I read The Seven Habits by Stephen Covey. Yes. And great book. I started it over the break again and realized, oh, man, these are some principles I – I need to be reminded of. And so we're going to, we'll probably do this one a little bit, uh, break it up a little more because each of the, it's better. Oh yeah. I want to break it yeah. up and have one habit. Let's talk about that habit for about a month and then go to the next habit. So we may take all of next year to read yeah. the whole thing, but Seven I don't know. That's great. But anyway, that's book club. By the way, I, I heard you make a comment at the very beginning of our conversation. That was seven habits. I was going to call you out on it, but I did. Which one was that? It was uh, seek first to be understood. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's a coveyism. Yeah. It's practical application. I mean, there's, there's so many great things um, with those seven habits. It's I think it's sold like 30 million copies or something, oh, yeah. and it's oh, yeah. uh, tried and true. So very true. I heard him speak when he wrote the book. I mean, oh. I remember distinctly when he came in. I think he had published the book that year, and he was speaking of the principles. And I wasn't in a place in my life at that point to really understand what he was talking about, but it did at least resonate as to like sharpen the saw, right? It's, you, you've got to understand that there's work smarter versus work, work working harder. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of principles that later when I became interested in the book and read the book, I reflected back on that experience having him speak and it, it, it's just is built over time. So very interesting. Um, what's a question that I should have asked that I haven't asked you that you've 
probably thought I might. Yeah, maybe you're going to ask our follow-up questions to which of my teams I follow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All uh, right, give me a team, baseball, no, football. I, I, I like the Utah Jazz. Uh, I like the NBA. Good. Um, I'm more of a college person, though. Uh, oh, okay. I, I do like a lot of college. I follow Brigham Young University, BYU is my team. So Perfect. Um, sometimes it's it's a lot of fun. Sometimes it's very painful being a fan of, <laughs> of the Cougars. But I am a Cougar true and true. And, um, in fact, uh, if you, yeah, just a fun fact. This shows you how much I am a cougar. I, it's BYU, and so yeah. for sure, it's just the Y. And the so, uh, my wife and I, we met there. Each of our kids have a Y in their name on purpose uh, by design. Uh, okay. Um, we have license plates that are all reference um, to to BYU, and so we're all in. We go to the best basketball games, the football games, and all of that. So I love that's it. one of the reasons why Utah, aside from the skiing and golf and all those kind of things it was Four really seasons. hard yeah uh to be to be to put it into even more perspective at uh, some remember the jimmer mania that happened back in around 2011 or so jimmer for was a big basketball player and national yeah. player of the year and was was uh all the all the hype around byu well that was when i was in latin america and i distinctly remember that it was during the uh ncaa tournament that I was in a very remote place in Argentina for work. Uh -huh. And I was trying in my hotel room, trying to get the internet to work so I could listen to this, <laughs> this game. Um, and I was frustrated and I said, this is it. I cannot do this anymore. Uh, I cannot live. And so anyway, it was only a couple months later after that, that we decided to, um, I had finished my expatriate assignment and I decided to come back home and I, I selected Utah as the place to come back home. Beautiful. That gives a lot more reference context to yeah. everything. I like it. That's great. All right. So this is now your choice. I'm going to give you the option to pick the topic and uh, you get to determine what we're going to discuss next. So I'm going to give you four choices of the four. Pick one. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first is faith. The next is music. The next is family. And the last is workaholic versus balanced life. I think we've already talked about faith a little bit. Let's. What about music? Let's talk about music. Do is music a part of your life? Is it something that's very important to you? Absolutely. How so? It always has been. Um, it goes back. I, my parents had me in piano lessons when I was so I took piano okay. for eight years. Uh -huh. I did the trumpet in in high school. I was in. I was one of those choir boys. I wasn't an athlete. I was a choir boy in high school. And um, in fact, I was in. Uh, Performing group in in University of BYU. I was in the men's course for a couple of years. Nice. Um, so music's always been a part of my life, and in fact, uh, my wife and I's first day, we went to kind of a music concert, and we kind of go to that concert every year uh, oh. as in commemoration of that. Okay. It's called Christmas Around the World um, that BYU puts on there at oh. the Marriott Center. So yeah, I, music is absolutely part of my life. Uh, in fact, it gets me through when I want to focus. I turn on some soundtracks. I can't have. I'll start singing if I have some, you know, music that has lyrics. Okay. And so if I really need to focus, I'll close my door and turn on a soundtrack of some sort. Instrumental. Uh, yeah, instrumental like Hans yeah. Zimmer. Yeah. Uh, some of those I, that keeps gets me in a in a zone, I guess, to focus. So music is extremely important to me, and when I know that I really, really need to focus, I flip something like that on, and I'm I'm in a zone. Interesting. So one that comes to mind for me is Herb Albert. Okay. So I enjoy Herb Albert. You know, I have a station that I've dedicated with a lot of jazzy kind of music and so forth. That's a great office type music for me. And is that what you listen to when you're in the office? Yeah, focusing? I do that. Well, I actually change it up a bit because I have people in the office. We have an open work environment mm -hmm. and the remote for the so I have it's kind of like a bachelor's pad. I mean, if I'm going to be honest, I've got a television on the wall with a sound bar. And whenever I come in, I turn it on and it appears, I'm learning this, that no one else likes the music. Everyone prefers <laughs> it quiet. So out of out of uh, my own interest, I turn it on. But what's interesting is I try to keep it interesting. So I change up the stations all the time. I'll go from country to classic to rock to, you know, some jazzy kind of thing to I'll do show tunes. We'll listen to obviously a lot of the, the musicals that are out mm -hmm. there. I just love it. I love music. And they're there's my driving music. I won't listen to my driving music when I'm in the office. I mean, there's, there's occasional music. It's, it's suiting the environment, I guess. And so I have my go-tos in the car, do you, music or podcasts. Oh, interesting. So I've recently gotten into podcasts quite heavily, mm -hmm. but I really enjoy either country when I'm trying to just drive 
casually, or I do have a, a heavy foot. So if I want to, I can get into some good rock music and I'll enjoy that quite a lot. So that's fun. Yeah. I'll I, actually, I've got a side by side that I go riding in and that's where I pull out the, the fast, hard music. Cause I, I ride fast. Yeah. I, if I had like a, a uh, rough day or I have, I'm really thinking about something and I know I can't concentrate. It's definitely not a podcast or a book, but for the yeah. most part, it's podcast or book. I, I actually like the commute time. So I, uh, the office was originally uh, in one County and I live in another one. So I live in, in Salt Lake County and it's in uh, Utah County. Yeah. So yeah. it's about a 35 minute uh, commute for me, but I, I enjoy it because that's my book time Yep. Uh, or my podcast time. Exactly. But if I'm really, if I know I can't concentrate because I'm thinking about what just happened or an interaction that I had and I need to think through then, it's definitely music time, but yeah. yeah, continuing on further about that. I mean, I, we love the theater and so music is a part of that. I, I serve, um, one of the, uh, the charity, um, one of my, yeah, I guess service, uh, opportunities is I'm on the uh, board for Hale Center Theater here in, in the Sandy area. Uh, so I do some of that and, uh, help with the finance committee there. Beautiful. Um, so we, we go to all of those shows that they have at the Hill theater. We go to Eccles theater down in Salt Lake. So exactly. our life is very much involved in music, um, uh, from many angles. So Russ Bradshaw, is he still on the board? He, he is. Yeah. Yeah. He served on the finance committee as well. He exactly. was head and then, uh, he's no longer head there, but he's, um, he serves, um, on the advisory board. Do uh -huh. me a favor. Say hi for me. I will. And I know Great Russ. guy. Yeah. The two Russes. Uh huh. Yeah. Russ Bradshaw, great Russ guy. Russ Anderson, yep. Uh -huh. I yeah, know him. Anderson Bradshaw. Okay, good. A small world. Has I he been on the show? It. Yes, he has. Okay. Yeah. He didn't do the video, though. He did okay. audio only. Oh, okay. So, yeah, long, long time ago. You got to get him on video. He's a lot better looking dude than I am. That's oh, he's a, good, sure. he's a good man. I like <laughs> Russ quite a bit. In fact, actually, uh, he was not on the podcast. Okay. If I remember right, I think I just did a webinar with him. So oh, I've, okay. I've had him on. I've had him once or twice. But I haven't uh, done him in the podcast setting, I think. So maybe I need to reach out to him again. Yeah. yeah small world. Okay, good. Guy. All right. So the next thing is rapid fire. So I'm going to just ask you some things and you're going to just pick one or the other, either or, real quick. Okay. You ready? Drive or fly? Fly. Breakfast or dinner? Dinner. Disneyland or Disney World? Disney World. Introvert or extrovert? Introvert. Read a book or watch a movie? Read a book. Money or fame? You can do a lot of good things with money. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Okay, good. Um, what I'd like to do is now wrap this up. I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought. Okay. And just see what last words you, you'd have of advice and so forth. So first of all, obviously, everyone listening, I want to thank you for participating, hearing this. This has been a great conversation. I think what Lee has been able to share with us today is phenomenal. Uh, I do want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the podcast. Definitely do so. Set it up so you can get the notifications as needed. And more importantly, go back and listen to the past episodes. We've got a variety of excellent guests that we've had on the show where we've, where we've addressed topics ranging from marketing, selling, mental health, pricing services, client relations, so many more things. As for today, obviously one of the things that I really enjoyed was the conversation that we had about uh, purchasing the business. Lee's had a phenomenal career starting in the corporate world. He admitted that he doesn't, didn't necessarily get drawn into accounting, but that's easily what he's done and he's excelled at it. But then he went into that stage of retirement. He golfed as much as he could, skied as much as he could, and found himself in a position where he could purchase a firm. And he did exactly that. And he's had a phenomenal run. More importantly, he's grown it now two times over in nearly two years. So great growth and success there. But the things that we talked about as to how he determined the worth or the valuation of the business that he was acquiring, I thought was very insightful. I like the conversation about retaining the principal owner beforehand, how she's stayed on board, the culture that they had in the office, and how he was able to retain a lot of that. We talked about sacred cows and whether or not there was anything that needed to be changed or couldn't be changed. Lots of great principles there. In doing so, we also talked about business and how he has learned some excellent principles, one of which I thought was very important, which is just creating a safe environment where people can make mistakes and learn and realize that we're not perfect, but we can better ourselves. I really enjoyed the book club conversation. Uh, honestly, it's something that I have done myself before. And I just think a lot where, like Lee mentioned, you can have as part of your conversation within your office, basically reference points from past readings that you've had where everybody has some context to build upon. 
that's an excellent thing to consider as you're running your business is basically being involved in a book club, continually learning and benefiting from that. The other thing that I'd like to also point out is he really talked about family and how valuable and important it is and the example that he's setting not only for his children, but those around him to really show how work ethic pays off and having that commitment. So a lot of great conversations. I appreciated him sharing his faith, talking about things that I think are very important. He brought up love, and I, I think that's a worthwhile discussion to consider. But at the end of this whole conversation, I hope that you found that he is, as we all are, committed to making our businesses be successful. There's just that all-consuming interest in what we're doing next. And he shared that a little bit earlier on. Now, as for offers, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do as listeners is definitely check out the episode description. You're going to find some things there that would be helpful to uh, basically work on your business as they relate to the conversation today. For example, training staff, you can look there and see what resources are available to train your staff to become professional bookkeepers, professional tax preparers, perhaps going in so far as learning QuickBooks and so forth. Those tools and resources are available for you to actually implement with your team and take those quality people that have proven themselves to be loyal and committed with good work ethic to give them the skills they need to actually excel in the business. The other thing that I'd like to point out is we talked a little bit about CFO services and the services that he's providing in addition to the bookkeeping, the additional analytics to inform the client as to what they can be doing in business, how you can become more of a CFO and advisor and incorporate some of those services into your firm. If you'd like to learn more about what it is you can do to become, in fact, a CFO and advisor for your clients and get paid well providing those additional services, check out what it is that you can do from the Universal Business Builder. There's information that is regarding all of this in the episode description that I'd love for you to check out. Lastly, I want to ask for that closing thought. So what do you have for us? Well, you summarized it very well. Uh, no, just thanks for having me and thanks for what you do for the community. I think it's important that we as a community come together and, and learn from each other. There's there's so much opportunity out there. And um, I think if we, we come together and network and, and continue to learn, then we can make the world better out there and help people and entrepreneurs run their businesses in a way uh, that they become profitable. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you again for being on the show. Everyone, this has been an amazing experience. Obviously, remember this. If you'd like more information on how to apply these principles in your business, reach out to us at Universal Accounting. You can do so going to universalaccountingschool.com or visiting us uh, by calling 801-265-3777. And always remember, be safe out there. And if it's about accounting, it is universal.